Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to have you back with us today. We are sitting here on Tuesday morning, the week of Christmas, and Christmas is one, two, three, three days away. Looking forward to that. And uh, we're excited in Florida because it's going to be cold on Christmas Day, which is a rare thing. And so we're excited about that. It might feel a little bit more like Christmas. And uh, so uh, also excited about our Christmas Eve service. I do want to let you know that with our Christmas Eve service that we have planned for uh, Fair and Park, downtown Eustis, the Van Shell, uh, like we've been doing for the last several years, that is in pretty serious jeopardy right now because it looks like we're gonna have a lot of rain on Thursday. So I'm just letting you know that most likely we're gonna end up here at church. We're gonna wait till tomorrow to make that decision uh, for sure. Um, uh, we'll, we'll wait for the um, the day before Christmas Eve to make that decision, but most likely we're going to be looking at doing the service here at the church building instead. So if we can't do it at the park, we're going to have it at 5 and at 7 here at the church. You can choose which service you want to come to, and uh, both, uh, both services will be identical, but um, just wanted you to know about that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, so make sure that you be watching, you be watching, make sure that you're watching for updates through our email and we'll put it on Facebook and we'll put it on our push notifications on our app as well. So just be watching for that. And if you could, uh, if you could, as soon as that information gets uh, shared and put out, would you share that with people just to make sure that people realize that? Um, and that would be great if you could help with that. Um, so today we're back in the God, or back in the story of, of the book of Acts. We have been watching how God has moved in the early church, how he has challenged the people, how the church has responded in terms of their passion and their boldness and their courage to stand up for the gospel. We see the church flourishing, we see the church growing that daily, the number of people who were being saved were was increasing every day and there was much victory. There's also much pain, there's a lot of heartache, and there's a lot of stress and a lot of problems in the early church. Uh, they had problems from without, meaning outside of the church, they had persecution. There was problems inside the church. There was some fighting and there was some turmoil and there was some messiness. And that's part of life, we have to understand that. that any kind, anytime you have people that are gathered together, um, doing life together, there's gonna be some messy parts of that. Doesn't mean we're wrong, doesn't mean that it's broken, it just means that we're messy. And that's that's where the Holy Spirit works, is in the mess of our lives. And so uh, we see that as we walk through this. Today we look at a pretty cool story. Um, actually today's a good story. Tomorrow's probably even a better story that we're gonna look at in the book of Acts. Uh, but we're gonna be in chapter 16. So to give us an idea of what's gone on is, Paul has been on a missionary journey already come back from that first missionary journey, starting churches, planting churches, encouraging the believers all around the um, all around the landscape of Palestine in those days. And we see that uh, he's getting ready to embark on a second missionary journey. Yesterday we looked at the idea that he and Barnabas had this disagreement. Um, Barnabas wanted to take Mark along with him. Uh, Paul says, absolutely not. He kind of deserted us. There was a disagreement. They parted ways, right? Barnabas went this way. Paul went this way. He chose Silas to go with him. So Paul and Silas set out on this missionary journey. Something interesting takes place, and we're not going to talk a long time about this, but I just think it's worth mentioning. Verse or Chapter 16, verse 1 says, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra. So if you remember those two names, those are two cities he's already been to. His first missionary journey, he went through those cities planted churches. It was in Lystra uh, that Paul was stoned uh, nearly to death, and they drug him outside the city. Uh, he was badly beaten, badly persecuted, but yet he gets back up, goes back in the city, and begins to preach again, right? And so the church had begun there, and uh, men and women and kids had been discipled and been challenged there. And so in uh, in verse, verse 1, it says, Paul came to Derby and then Lystra, which is where he had been before, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a, and, and a believer, but whose father was Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. So here we see that Paul gets together with Timothy. As this first linking we see of those two. Maybe he was there at the beginning when Paul preached the gospel, most likely made his decision to follow Jesus. 
He'd been brought up by his mother and his grandmother to love the Lord. And um, Timothy is this great guy. We're going to see Timothy uh, be instrumental in the early church, right? We have the books First and Second Timothy, which Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy becomes an evangelist. He roots himself in the city of Ephesus a little bit later on. He preaches the gospel there, and he is the uh, pastor there in the city of Ephesus. So I just think that's neat to see. This is that connection that's made between he and Paul, and then from there on we see Timothy involved in ministry. Um, I just love how it says in verse 5, just as a side note, it says it in passing, it says, So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. All through the book of Acts we get this reminder that the church is moving forward. All the attacks, all the persecution, all the, the people who are against the church, yet the church still thrived, the church still grew, it was successful in all of its adventures. Um, the next section in, in my Bible, in verses 6 through verse 10, uh, talks about this interesting dynamic where Paul is wanting to go and preach, uh, trying to figure out where God is leading him. In the middle of the night, he has a vision of a man in this country called Macedonia calling for him to come and share the gospel. And so Paul and his partners, uh, Bar uh, Silas and uh, Timothy, they take off for Macedonia to preach the gospel. Here's where I think it's so cool what happens here. In verse 11, and this is one of those things where if you're thinking, man, I, I don't know that I, I, I have anything to offer to God. I'm not, I'm just a, I'm not significant. I don't have a lot of influence. I'm just kind of an average Joe, right? This is one of these great texts that I love. Verse 11 says, from Troas, we put out to sea. So when it says we, he's talking about Luke is saying this. Luke is with them. He's the author of this. Luke is saying, we set out, uh, we put out to sea and sailed straight for uh, Samothrace, and the next day we ended up in Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi. Maybe you remember the word Philippi, the city of Philippi. We have a book of the Bible called Philippians. Uh, a Roman col colony in the, leading, uh, in the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. She, uh, When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she says, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. I love this story, how it unfolds. Paul ends up in Philippi, going to preach the gospel because they felt like that's where God was leading him to go. They come in, they're looking for uh, people of like-mindedness. Uh, that's what they do a lot of times. They, they want to get a group of people that maybe have already believed in Jesus or at least are God-fearing God -fearing people. So he finds a group of people gathered now by the river outside of town. Uh, these him, ends up being a group of women. Um, and these were most likely uh, Greek women. Uh, so they were Gentile women that had a um, had a love for the Lord, um, had a desire to know God more, that wanted to worship God. They hadn't made a full-on switch to the Jewish faith and custom, but they were worshipers of God. And so it says that Paul sat down and began to explain the gospel to them, the idea of who Jesus was, of what Jesus did for us, and the fact that he came for our salvation— the Bible says that uh, Lydia, this one woman, um, made the decision to accept Jesus, to accept the message, to accept the gospel truth. And it says she and her family, her household, were baptized. Uh, this doesn't mean that she forced this on them. It just probably means that she heard the gospel uh, preached, accepted the gospel, and then through her testimony and through maybe the invitation of Paul to explain the gospel to the rest of her family, they all made the decision to be baptized. And um, I just love that that quick conversion, the idea of why do I need to put off this decision to be baptized? Why should I put off the decision to make Jesus the Lord of my life? It, it should be a, um, a an immediate thing that we do when we recognize what God has done for us. But what I think is really interesting here to me is it says that she asked and invited them to come to her home. A little bit later on in uh, chapter 16, actually uh, all the way near the end of chapter 16, the Bible says that Paul and Silas had been thrown in prison. 
There's a whole story with the prison thing and, and how they converted the jailer and just really interesting things. Eventually, they're released from prison. After they're released from prison, at the end of chapter 16, it says they go back to Lydia's house to join the believers in worshiping God. One of the things that we see is that Lydia's house becomes the epicenter of the, Philipp the Philippian church. So when Paul writes a letter to the Philippian church later, years later, um, when he's in prison, um, he's writing to the church that was birthed in Lydia's house. That Lydia was the first convert in Philippi who made the decision to follow Jesus. Here is a woman. Uh, so there are some indications that she was um, an early in life that she was a slave woman. Uh, not totally sure on that. There's some allusions to that historically. Um, but here's a woman who, in a culture in the first century, that was that was just kind of not really heard of. She was a dealer in fine linen, which means she had worked her way to where she at least had a business going. Um, Yet, even, even though she had some things going for her, women in the first century were not viewed with uh, high respect. Yet, she opens her house and allows Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, most likely, to meet there, to gather there, to stay there for a, an extended period of time as they preach the gospel. And her home became the epicenter for the church growing and flourishing in Philippi. Philippi... Uh, the church at Philippi became one of these churches where, man, they just did it right. They were faithful to the Lord. Uh, Philippians, uh, it was like the, the when Paul writes, it's the book of joy and reminding them that they should stay faithful to the Lord even in their hardship, and they did. And So there's really some neat things that come out of that in their ministry at Philippi. And it's all because uh, a woman said yes to Jesus uh, about accepting Jesus and then said, God, whatever I have, um, I'll use for your glory. And that just happened to be her house, that she opened her house for the church to meet in. And the church from there continued to grow and rapidly influence the community. And so I, I say that today because, first of all, if you've never said yes to Jesus for uh, and accepted Christ, if you've never said yes to his gift of salvation, that's, that's your first step. And I would say it's an urgent step. You don't want to put that off. Um, the second thing is... Have you said yes to Jesus in terms of your availability? Have you made the decision to say, God, whatever you have entrusted to me, I give to you. God, I, I give you, God, I'm going to give you my time so that you can, you can order my steps. God, I'm going to, I'm going to give you my tongue so that I, that, that you can use my speech to influence and, and encourage others. God, these are some giftings that I have. I'm good at these kind of things. I'm I've got some strengths in these areas. God, I'm going to give those to you that you would use them. God, you've given me a big home. Uh, you've given me a nice home. You've given me uh, an abundance of groceries. You've given me um, kind words to speak to other people. God, you've given me, uh, I don't know, you've given me extra money this year. Uh, I'd like to use that for your glory. What are the things that you need to say yes to Jesus about that God has blessed you with? He's given those things to you that you might bless someone else with. Um, for Lydia, it was her home. She said, God, you can use my home. And we see the church flourish after she was willing to say yes. So be encouraged by that. You might think you don't have anything to offer, but I guarantee you, you have something to offer. Uh, maybe it's just your time. Maybe it's your, uh, the words you, you speak. Um, maybe it's uh, some encouragement to someone else. Maybe it's a blessing to someone else financially. But you have something to offer to Jesus. And you never know how God might take that and bless other people um, eternally through that. So be encouraged by that. And uh, tomorrow we'll jump into the end of chapter 16, which is a really cool story with Paul and Silas. So let's pray today. God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the compassion you have for us, your willingness to step into our lives, God, to redeem us, to uh, solve our sin problem through Jesus and his sacrifice. God, we're grateful that Jesus did not remain in the tomb, but he rose from the dead, giving us the power over sin and death as well. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be like Lydia, a woman who was willing to say yes to you, to make herself available to you. So God, in those things that we have in our own life, I pray that you would help us become more responsive to what you would have us do, that we'd be willing to say yes to you, that we would be willing to... Um, agree to use our assets and our resources and our strengths and our time and our money 
well, God, for your glory, uh, that we would surrender it to you. So God, today I say, take what you have given me, God, and use it. And I pray that we would all make those decisions in our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, hope you have a great day today. Uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. And then uh, looking forward to Christmas Eve as well. So stay tuned for updates and share them as soon as you get them. God bless. We'll see you tomorrow morning.